Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Higher Ed Dreaming brought to you by volunteers in the higher ed community. And that's why we call it For Higher Ed by Higher Ed. We're thrilled to have you all here today, and we're especially excited about the incredible lineup of sessions we have in store. To get started, let's take a moment and to express our heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has helped make this dream a reality. We'd like to start with a special shout out to our esteemed Higher Education Advisory Council members and the dedicated volunteers whose support has been instrumental in bringing this event to you. We extend our heartfelt thank you to our presenters for their hard work and valuable contributions. Your efforts are deeply appreciated. And thank you to our sponsors for your support and helping us realize this dream for our higher ed community. We really couldn't do this without you. To the community, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Holy moly, we've over 700 registrants for today's event. We beat last year, so congratulate yourselves. This is quite incredible, wow. Last but not least, a special thank you to the exceptional leaders I have the honor of volunteering with to organize this event. Haley Gold, Carrie Otto, and Frank Montoya. Your dedication and vision have been instrumental in bringing this event to life. Now it's time to give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, the remarkable Peter Coffey, who will be delivering a picture of what's to come. Peter, we sincerely appreciate your commitment to education and invaluable insights that continue to shape the landscape of higher education. For those of you who may not be familiar, Peter Coffey is the VP of Strategic Research at Salesforce, boasting an impressive career spanning over 17 years with that organization. His extensive background includes notable contributions to prominent publications such as eWeek, PC Week, Computer Language, and AI Expert. Peter's experience is not limited to technology and research. He's made, an, he's made impactful contributions to national security AI applications at the Aerospace Corporation. Additionally, his past roles at what was Exxon Corporation have taken him to various locations from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic. With an engineering degree from MIT and an MBA from Pepperdine University, Peter has also shared his expertise as a lecturer at the prestigious institutions such as Stanford, Caltech, Harvard Business School, and MIT Sloan School of Management and the Media Lab. Beyond his professional endeavors, Peter is the co-founder and president of the Foundation for Intelligent Life on Earth, actively supporting initiatives focused on climate change, conservation, STEAM education, and the exploration of Earth and space. But before we dive into Peter's insights, we're almost there, let's have some fun. Have you ever played two truths and a lie? Hmm. Well, we have a little game for you. You're going to guess the lie about Peter. So you're going to see a poll pop up on your screen. And if you'll take a moment and submit your answer, and I see Peter looking very serious there. Nobody can read the cards. Which one will it be? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and make my guess. It looks like the majority of you are calling out performed at Carnegie Hall as the That's lie. That's the lie, That's the lie. That's okay. the lie, can you believe that? Peter, is that the lie? That is actually the least lie because I've done it twice. You hear that? <laughs> so surprise to all, we have a twist for you. All four statements are true. Amazing. But Carnegie Hall was the least believable. Okay, noted. <laughs> <laughs> to, our, to our attendees, please feel free to engage with us uh, during this session. Uh, we are going to collect some Q&A. Um, so there's a tab labeled Q&A um, on the right-hand side of your screen. We will have some time at the end of the session to address a few. As shared earlier, the session is recorded and the slides will be shared after the event. So no need to worry about screenshots. Enjoy the presentation. Take it away, Peter. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you all. And, and you should all thank your organizers for doing something that is very much like those four uh, truths that were just shared. None of those was something that I sought the opportunity to do. They were all cases where someone came to me and said, 
we need someone to, to, to fill this gap here. And the invitation to this keynote I included a placeholder title of a picture of what's to come. This is not a title I would have chosen. And they said, well, would you like to change that? And I said, no, 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 let's go with that. If that's what you want, let's respond to that because it, it's something people do a lot, which is make predictions. And it's something I strenuously try to avoid doing, which is the making of predictions for a number of reasons, which I'd like to share before we get into what I'm going to do instead of predicting to make you th th this, this picture that I do intend to, to share with, with some depth. Um, I say a picture of what's to come, not the picture, because a phrase that I stole from my colleague, Peter Schwartz, is that you need to overcome the tendency to predict. We tend to pick a, a prediction and put error bars on it and think that, well, now we're dealing with our uncertainties, but really uncertainty isn't like that. Uncertainty tends not to be simple continuous bell curves around a central you know, number. Scenarios are, are punctuations, you know, either something happens or it doesn't, and the situations can be dramatically altered based on something that was maybe unlikely, but foreseeable. If you want an example of the, the hazard of proceeding based on what's the most likely thing to happen, all you need to do is imagine roulette, where the least risky bet you can make in a roulette wheel is put it all on red or put it all on black, that you know, pays even money. And in an American roulette wheel with both zero and double zero, there's a 95% chance that you'll break even on the next uh, uh, spin if you bet evenly on red and black. But there are those green slots. And if you do that even number, even bets on both red and black 13 times, over the course of 13 spins, there is a 50-50 chance that you wind up losing it all and being wiped completely out because you failed to allow for an unlikely but foreseeable and, and plausible scenario. The green ball would never be your forecast. It would never be your prediction, unless you know something about that wheel that you should not know, but it is a scenario. These things matter because we're surrounded now by this abundance of data and the power to work with that data and the temptation to make data-driven, data-based predictions has never been as great as it is today. But as, uh, as my friend Dennis Pombriant said, the problem is people who've seen Moneyball think you can run your, your business the way they were running a baseball team. But in a baseball team, everyone agrees on what the relevant numbers are. The only thing that matters is, did you score runs? And so you know, to work backwards, can you get on base? Well, everyone knows what those things are. And in the world of out, outside the baseball park, there's a little bit more um, openness to, well, different definitions of success. And the problems that we face today include that the abundance of data that's cheap and uh, accurate may or may not be relevant in the famous term streetlight effect. Why are you looking for your keys here when you lost them in that puddle up the street? Well, the light's so much better here. We look where the light is and looking in the dark, wet, muddy puddle for the information you need isn't a pleasant prospect, but that may be where the answers are. Extrapolation from that data is something that people think they can do by doing a line fit in a spreadsheet. And when you discover that the error bars on extrapolations are actually hyperbole curves, hyper hyperbolic hairpin curves that diverge wildly as we get farther out, many people are surprised by that. They think they're error bands, and they're not. They're error hyperbole. Making extrapolations from data should be done with, with tremendous caution. And among the challenges is that there's so much data out there that correlations are now easy to find. Whether they have actual predictive power, however, is a different proposition than that. There's a wonderful website called Spurious Correlations that includes observations like the number of non-commercial space launches appears to be remarkably correlated with the number of sociology doctorates awarded in the U.S., does anyone think there's predictive power in that pattern, no matter how strong it may have been from past data? You need to avoid that. We also tend to hear a lot about you know, wisdom of crowds. Look at all the data we can collect and get people's opinions and, and get this wise crowd effect. This is analogous to the ability today to mine a viable gold mine. If there's only one gram of gold per ton of ore because the technology is so large scale and so efficient. And the cost of sifting crowd stream data are likewise falling. You might say, well, look, oh, you know, if we can sift a million people's opinions, we're going to get something. 
And there are different ways of doing this. Delphi method deliberately takes people who don't know a lot and puts their numbers together because research has shown that you get remarkably accurate and interesting results that way. Or the open source method where you have actual expertise and people come together and put their results together. But the crucial observation in a paper in the National Academy of Sciences some years ago is that social influence destroys wisdom of crowd effect. And if people can see each other's opinions before they express their own, you don't get wise crowds, you get dumb herds. This is a conversation I had with Tom Malone at MIT when he was talking about what, what's the IQ of a group compared to the IQ of its members. It's not the average, it's not the maximum, it's, it's something much more complicated than that. And I asked him, with email where you see a question and you think about it and you give your answer before you see other people's answers, do you get better results? than you get in live meetings or increasingly in real time chat type channels where you don't have that opportunity to form your own opinion before you see other people's opinions. He said, that's an area for research. We, we, we know we need to work on that. And the order it matters, diversity of contribution has to come with independence, people not being afraid to express what might turn out not to be the majority opinion, decentralization of those results, and aggregation of the results only at the end of the process if you want to get wise crowd effect. Because it's very hard to evade what I call the two traps of the anchor and the bell. We tend to anchor on the first thing that's said in a meeting and then work on you know, error bars up and down as opposed to someone saying, well, let me try something completely different. There tends to be a certain impatience. And we're, no, 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 we already know kind of what we're doing and now we're just fine tuning it. And say, could we start all over again with a completely different idea? That's not necessarily going to be socially cool in a prediction session. Anchors are everywhere, even inside our own heads. Wonderful experiment. Students were asked to write down the last two digits of their own social security number. And then a little while later, they were asked to place bids, maximum amounts on products. I mean, we're talking a mug, um, a, a, a digital keyboard, whatever. And it turned out that people whose social security number last two digits are in the upper 20%, like you know, from 80s to 90s, placed enormously higher bids than students who had written down low numbers in their social security numbers. They were asked, by the way, do you think those numbers you wrote down at the beginning had any impact on your bid? And they would say, oh, no, 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 no. And yet statistically meaningful result, merely stating those large numbers made their bids go up. There are anchors even in our own minds, let alone with the other people around the table. Now the bell, we tend to think that the world is modeled in bell curves. We do this because we've sort of been taught from, from early on that you, you get these, these nice curves, but technically the normal distribution has tails that go to infinity in both directions. And there are lots of things that we model. We say, well, what's the mean and standard deviation on that test score? Except that if you're modeling means and standard deviations, you're so in, implying that there could be negative results. And I don't know of any teacher who gives a negative result on a test. Negative values are often not even possible. Real world looks a little bit more like log normal, where the logarithm of the number is what's normally distributed. That has a, no, a lot of nice attributes as a curve. It can't go negative for one thing, and it reflects our realistic understanding that more often things go unreasonably high than unexpectedly low. Things take much longer or a little less. They cost much more or a little less. Log normal curves are, are nice for modeling, but even these are misleading because there's a hump. We tend to think that if we know the average, if we know the most likely value. Well, if you flip a coin, the average result is that it lands on edge, except that this hardly ever happens. It's a lumpy distribution. It's going to be one or the other. And this is kind of like scenario thinking, isn't it? It's not going to be some nice, simple thing that we can predict. It's going to be one result or a different result, both foreseeable, maybe not equally likely, but both must be provided for. And as a friend of mine in Mumbai once said, you don't know if the monsoon is going to be early or late. You don't know if it's going to be heavy or light. But if you have to go out and buy an umbrella on the first day of the monsoon, you really haven't been thinking very clearly because the fact that a monsoon would come is, is something that is going to happen. And crucially, when the monsoon is over, you don't throw away the umbrella. You dry it, you put it away, you have it ready for the next time. And the way we are now needing to think about many things that used to be considered unlikely, 
or extreme or rare is that these things are now going to be coming with increasing frequency. The so-called hundred year storms that now come every 10 years, the kind of upheavals that occur in supply chains that McKinsey warns us now are typically going to occur at least once in any given four year period. We need to become more resilient and more prepared for foreseeable, rare, but devastating if not anticipated scenarios in many areas. In general, TLDR predictions are mostly wrong. One of the most thorough studies of the art and practice of predicting things looked at 300 different experts and 27,000 predictions and found that in fact, typical accuracy was about the same as that of a dart throwing chimpanzee. And so when people say, I'm gonna predict this based on data, I'm gonna predict this based on an algorithm, I'm gonna predict this based on machine learning, I'm not saying run for the doors, but keep some guardrails in mind because the behavior of prediction is something to be approached with, with dis discretion and, and judicious skepticism. So I've been asked to do today a picture of what's to come and yet here I am saying, that predicting is a bad idea that most people do badly. What's my cheat code? I don't make predictions, I bet on certainties. For example, in August of 2019, there were some photons leaving Proxima Centauri in the afternoon and they are gonna hit the surface of the earth today as I'm finishing this talk. I don't think that's a prediction. I think that's a future that's, or, that's, that's already happened. It hasn't become observable here yet, but it is a future that has happened already and in many cases, the things that matter to us most in the community of interest in this event are very much futures that are already baked in, going to happen. It's really not a prediction. For example, demographic change. This is um, blue is male, pink is female. Sorry, I didn't pick the color code. It's very conventional. Um, age bands of five-year ages from zero to five at the bottom strip all the way up to that top little pyramid. And in 2023, we've got uh, an interesting distribution. It's getting a little fatter than it used to be. It used to be more of a you know, pyramid. And we're starting to see more you know, stuff. But there's a little interesting you know, kind, of, kind of midriff bulge down there. What's that little bulge down there? Um, family starts were postponed due to the global financial crisis. So there's a little bit of a contraction. And now there's that little muffin top there starting to, to show up. And now I can talk about, you know, this is going to go like a pig through a python. In another 10 years, those people are going to be 10 years older. Another 10 years, those people are going to be, you know, another 20 years, those people are going to be a little older. We know to a statistically strong level of confidence that we're going to be seeing an interesting bulge in the population as it moves through. But let's talk not about the bulge. Let's talk about that little gap when people postponed having kids. Oh, that was around 2008. Well, 18 years later in 2026, those postponed kids are going to be non-existent high school graduates. They're just not going to be there. They're already using the term enrollment cliff to describe what's going to happen to your middle tier private colleges that have always been a little bit challenged post global financial crisis and attracting students. And, and many of them are going to see a marked decline. That is not my phrase. The rolling aftershock of the Great Recession. There is no arguing with demography as, as was observed in this article in Vox. Anticipating this is not predicting. Anticipating this is looking up and seeing that someone has dropped a safe off the building and it's falling toward you. You don't wait until you feel the breeze ruffling your hair to get out of the way. You know it's on the way. Is there another source of, of demand for higher education? Well, yes, there is. Let me introduce the new elderly. The fastest growing age group with the most vigorous growth of wealth, of interest in new experience. These are not the people we used to think of as the candidates for higher ed. These are people who got their degrees years ago. Yes, but they're living longer. They're preferentially moving to retirement in communities that have strong uh, colleges and access to you know, symphony orchestras and, and late career education. For that matter, they're working a lot longer and they need the equivalent of multiple bachelor's degrees to maintain their skills over a period of working years that's longer when knowledge cycles have become more rapid. And so 
rethinking the candidate student, not as the new high school graduate, as, as the head of the National Education Association said, the, the freshman being dropped off at Leafy Green U in the family minivan with the graduation date four years from now already circled on the calendar, that's, that hasn't gone away. But as the representative college student of the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's increasingly less important than it used to be. Another crucial observation is that the elderly who are sometimes perceived as not being technically aware or not being comfortable with change, well, you know, age actually means you've been through more changes. And data actually shows that middle-aged and even later stage career people are more adaptable and more ready to work with imperfect early stage technology than younger people who may literally never have touched any kind of computer that wasn't essentially magic black glass. Computer science professors will already tell you today that they're getting entering freshmen who when asked a question like, well, where did you save your file? Not only don't know the answer, but don't understand the question. They've literally never worked on a machine where exposure to the file system and the notion of a file pathway, you say, well, it's like a file cabinet. Oh, right. They've been, they've been putting stuff in Mendela file folders and file cabinets all their lives. No, they haven't been doing that either. So not only the, the technology and the facts and the details, but even the metaphors that we use for these things need to be considered from a generational point of view. Because meanwhile, the, uh, the tour that The Economist magazine made of the old age homes in a number of countries you know, all around the world, they found, oh, yeah, using smartphones and tablets is what people want to do. And a friend of mine said, well, Peter, isn't it obvious? It's not that old people got tech savvy. It's that tech savvy people are getting older. And the person who was the first one on the block to be showing people how to use this, this newfangled thing called a mouse back in 1984 well, oddly enough, here they are, um, having gone from being in their 20s to being in their 60s, and they will still be doing the tech support, only now they're doing it for their kids and their grandkids, because this is something they've learned how to do. Now, if we're talking about change, you hear people say, yeah, well, what's the price tag for this going to be? When they say, we, we, you're saying, well, we need to be recruiting a different kind of student and offering a different kind of services, and say, yeah, but tell me about the price tag. Did you know the price tag is also is actually a fairly recent invention? Before John Wanamaker had this almost religiously inspired idea that you know prices should be the same for everybody. They shouldn't be based on the the retailer sizing up the customer across the counter and 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 beginning with a price like the uh, bazaar scene in um, Casablanca. Oh, for a very special friend of Rick, you know, well, well that's only one hundred. The notion that prices are visible and uniform is, is actually a fairly radical idea. Someone had to invent this thing. And prices are not just what does it cost. Prices are signals. Prices tell us what's becoming abundant or what's becoming scarce. It pains me when people say, oh gosh, the price of gasoline has gone up. We need to open the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. No, you don't. You need to treat the price of gasoline as a signal that the size of cars needs to shrink or that they need to shift to other uh, sources of energy. It's important not to mess with the signals. If, you're, if your car's temperature needle is going up, you don't try to fix the car by pushing the needle back down. You figure out what's pushing the needle up and you get that addressed. Because the number of ways to combine resources is huge and prices tell us what combinations make sense and what things to favor or disfavor in what we use. And the ridiculous example here is Arnold Schwarzenegger is a very valuable resource and the medical operating room is a very valuable resource, but combining the two and having the Terminator do your brain surgery, well, maybe not so much. Prices tell us how we should be responding to new abundance and new scarcity. Because as, as George Gilder said in 1996, it's a revolution when a new abundance or a new scarcity changes behavior. When price changes are a hundredfold, jobs change. Back in 1955, people said, oh yeah, you need to you know, rigorously check your code before you expose it to a machine because machine time is expensive and your time is cheap. And we sort of changed that idea radically with something called Turbo Pascal a few years ago. And we said, you know what, um, a, a PC can, 
can compile something more quickly than you can check it, can give you error messages. The, th the kind of diagnostics you get from Apex code in Salesforce, those are the kinds of things that people used to be expected to determine with so-called desk checking before they consumed valuable machine time to find that, that problem. These things are important at the scale of hundredfold changes in cost. They're way more important when you've got hundred billion fold changes in cost, which is what we've had between 1950 and 2010 in the amount of energy it takes to do computation. Much of what you're seeing today is the result of things that we could do at sort of a toy level with AI in the 1950s or even as recently as the 1980s or 90s, suddenly becoming radically more feasible to approach with stupefyingly huge amounts of computational power that, that were not even available in aggregate on the entire planet, let alone affordable. But now your most recent Apple Watch actually does Siri on the watch. It doesn't even have to call out to that server in your pocket called your iPhone anymore movement of the computational capacity to the edge of the network and more and more things being done is going to result in, for example, an elementary school teacher assigning not the task of writing a paragraph, but handing students a paragraph and say, an AI was given this question, this is what it wrote. What do you think of that? We will be able to start teaching critical analysis and editing of texts instead of laborious word-by-word you know, -word composition of a paragraph at an age far earlier than we ever could before. And this is what literally elementary school teachers are already saying. This is the future of, AI, of education in a world of AI is, is not that we say, oh, there's no point teaching English anymore. The AI will be doing their essays for them. No, it's better than that. It's that now we can teach critical analysis and recognition of weak arguments or faulty logic or suspect data, we can start to teach those skills far earlier than we ever could before, which is really quite genuinely exciting. Changes in price. That's also sometimes called inflation because they usually go up. We kind of got out of the habit of doing that because after the financial crisis, you know, the cost of capital was practically nothing. The, the discussion of the term inflation, people searching on Google for information about inflation, as you can see, that was a pretty flat, you know, kind of dull roar for years until it wasn't, until we suddenly started talking about this, this cost spike that we've seen over the last few years. And during that long period of time from, you know, the financial crisis until recently, in general, prices were flat or even declining. On average, things have gotten cheaper. Let me restate that. On average, things have gotten cheaper. That orange curve, that's the clear exception, is, oh, well, that's services. Finding people who know how to do stuff and do it reliably on time, that is a cost that's been going up. And that those people are, of course, the product of the educational system. Good news. The educational system is producing one of the few things whose value is in fact perceived to be rising, whose price in the marketplace is rising, even at a time when many other things seem to be in a, in a uh, race for the bottom on commoditization. But remember what I said earlier about averages. I said price changes generally haven't been too bad. Yeah, but the exceptions are pretty bad. Um, the things that have been getting you know, cheaper were things like, you know, PCs. The things that are getting more expensive are, oh, uh, medical care, education, food, housing. So life is getting cheaper if you don't mind being unhealthy, unskilled, hungry, and homeless. But I think most of us would have a problem with that. So saying anything based on averages always, in my opinion, should be unpacked and say, tell me about the distribution. Tell me about the outliers. Don't tell me that the average is going up or the average is going down because that can be as misleading as expecting a coin to land on edge when you flip it. Let's talk about prices of skills. It's not news that STEM skills are now being done by free websites. A friend of mine was taking a college statistics probability class and one of the uh, problems was estimate the odds of dealing a full house in poker. And on a whim, I went to Wolfram Alpha, a free website. This was years ago. I, I literally don't remember how long ago this was. It may have been eight or nine years. 
and just ask the question, what are the odds of dealing a full house? No context, didn't use the word poker in the question, just completely out of nowhere, just asked it, what are the odds? It accurately inferred that I might be talking about poker, suspected that I might be uh, talking about five card because that's the standard. And I'm sorry, I'm anthropomorphizing here to say that it suspected anything is silly. But what it gave me back was the actual number of possible hands, approximate probability, showed me its work. This is the free version. If I were using the paid version, I could get even more material from it on how to set up and structure this problem. Well, so STEM skills, we've known for a long time that those were getting done better and better by algorithms and robots. What's new is that now the STEAM skills, the artistic skills are becoming free websites. There was that earlier um, thought experiment out, well, what happens if you, uh, if you put Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator into an operating room and, and have it do brain surgery? And just on a whim, I went to Stable Diffusion and said, show me a picture of the Terminator doing brain surgery. Okay, it seems to be doing brain surgery on itself. And it's not really the, the image you have in mind when you talk about this. So I thought, okay, well, let's clarify the prompt. Make it performing brain surgery. Well, now I'm still getting that Schwarzenegger leather jacket, red glowing eyes vibe. It's, it looks like it might be in an operating room. I'm still not really getting the environment here. So I iterated the question one more time. Show me doing brain surgery in an operating room. It did something I totally didn't ask it to do. It conjectured the possibility of a, of a brain surgery robot where the surgical implements are built into its hands. Well, this is an idea that I didn't give it. It doesn't have to pick up a scalpel. It just has one of its fingers that can you know, extend to become a scalpel. But now I'm not really seeing that, that, that Terminator vibe from the movie. So I thought, okay, let me iterate on the question one more time. Let me have the Terminator cyborg holding a scalpel, wearing a surgical mask in an operating room. And it gave me a picture you may recognize because that in fact is where I got that illustration for that page. And that was the first time that I used AI to generate an image instead of just going out and you know, finding it with, with uh, some um, licensed uh, stock library or something. This is interesting because notice that what happened is that over a matter of a minute or two, in less time than it normally would have taken me to find the perfect image, if it even existed, I was able to have a, a, an iterative dialogue with the machine and say, okay, that's cool. Now you know, give me something a little bit different here. What we're seeing is that the art of producing the answer is becoming something that we let the machine do for us and we can focus on what's the right question. Now, interestingly, there's a fragment of dialogue from John Brunner's science fiction book, Stand on Zanzibar, that beautifully illustrates this idea. An AI has been placed in charge of planning an economic development program. And when they take it out of simulation mode and into production mode, it says, I don't believe you. And they say, what? what's wrong? This won't work. And eventually they bring a sociologist instead of a computer scientist into the room who has a conversation with it. He says, would it be fair to say you don't believe it? Okay, postulate that everything we've told you is true. What else would be necessary for it to be believable? And it comes back and says, well, I'd have to believe that something is making this population you know, not have the high crime and social unrest that I would expect given their level of poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've condensed this, this from two pages down to you know, one screen here. And the guy says, yep, the force exists. We're investigating it. I tell you three times, which is the code with this AI for believe this no matter what. And he says, okay, try it now. And they say, hey, he fixed it. 1968, the story is set in the year 2010. Arguably now in the 2020s, we are at the point where instead of trying to construct a cathedral out of toothpicks, I can point a machine at a pile of toothpicks and say, tell me what else we need to make this thing into a cathedral. And it says, oh, okay, you need to do this. This is a different way of thinking about programming, whatever that even means anymore. This is also something that we were working on in the 1980s at the Aerospace Corporation with some open source stuff from NASA called CLIPS. The PS stands for production system. I forget what the CLI was. This is a kind of programming in which you do not say what you want to happen. You merely describe what is and what goal you have. This is the famous monkeys and bananas experiment. Monkey comes into the room, bananas are hanging from the ceiling. There's furniture around the room, some things that it could move, some things too heavy for it to move. You describe the world, you represent the possible actions, you describe the state changes those actions produce, and then you state, this is my goal. My goal is I want to be able to execute the action of eating on the thing called the bananas, go. 
am watching a system like this find a pathway through the facts and actions and state changes and come up with a strategy is really quite a remarkable thing to do. And we were running this on PCs in the 1980s. Obviously, it's gotten better now. This is not, generally speaking, the way that programming is being taught. And I'm concerned about code camps and very you know, well-intentioned organizations teaching people to code in a way that is uh, imperative, in a way that is, you know, follow this recipe. Uh, we're, we're, we're not going to be writing recipes anymore. We're going to be representing worlds and asking iterative sets of questions and letting the machine do things that used to be done by people. That doesn't mean that people won't have jobs. They're going to have better jobs than they used to have. But the problem is that refining the art of programming, as it's been taught for years, is, is kind of like what's, what went on in the caves outside Beijing, where 800,000 years ago, someone thought, hey, instead of just looking for a rock that I can pound something with, what if I use one rock to shape another rock? An act of technology. And over the next 200,000 years, 10,000 generations of tool-using hominids refined their hand axes from five and a half down to four and a half centimeters as they became more dexterous. Not a lot of innovation going on there. Lots and lots of refinement, cool technology, but not a real change until around 30,000 before Common Era when someone thought, hey, wait a minute, what if I put a handle on this thing? And the first hammer that we know about emerged and that was a competitive advantage, only now anyone can buy a hammer with a handle. In fact, you know, better than a rock with a handle. GPT, which everyone is so excited about, is really just putting a handle on your hand X. It's adding leverage to AI, allowing it to digest massive quantities of data. The result is going to be profound. It's also going to be profoundly unequal. Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson, I believe, were among the first to introduce this term, the U-shaped curve. Your plumber and your dental hygienist are doing great. The rocket scientists and the financial analysts are doing great. A whole lot of people in the middle in what used to be called gray collar and pink collar jobs are in fact doing things that an algorithm or a robot can do. What do we do? What do we in the education and technology communities do to address the profound inequalities that are going to be intensified and, and why by the introduction of technology that takes over the middle of the U-shaped curve. Because you know what? A hammer that looks an awful lot like something that could have been made in 30,000 BC could be being used today to pound nails at minimum wage, or it could be being used to produce a magnificent sculpture. Same tool, different skills. The necessity of upskilling and reskilling as part of the AI conversation is, is so clear because the tools can enable the minimally skilled to do specific things remarkably well, and some work that's being done is being done in that direction. But tools that enable the more skilled to create what's never been imagined before, same tools, different environment created for their adoption and best use. And what we need to realize is that there are human attributes, human desires and goals that are not dependent on age. We know more and more that people of all ages want these things. And as Volodymyr Zelensky in the Ukraine has observed very recently, every day lets you change the baggage of any yesterday. The future doesn't happen to us. The future is what we decide today we're going to do tomorrow. And the people in this room craft that for the stakeholders and the the uh, the students and all the other people who are depending on us to come out of this meeting wanting to create that future together. Thank you for the chance to share these things with you. Peter, thank you so much. Very, very insightful. And I'm definitely going to turn this recording on a few times to go back and revisit many of those topics. Uh, Thank you to everyone who's posted questions in the chat. We do have a bit of time to ask a few of them. Peter, you can only imagine which one has received the top votes. Can we give it a guess? I'm sorry, I, 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 I wasn't watching the question stream and I was probably overusing my time. What, go ahead. Not to worry. Everyone wants to know, what did you perform at Carnegie Hall? 
Oh, um, um, I was uh, uh, part of a double choir performing a uh, Mozart mass in one year. And uh, the, the more interesting one, in my opinion, was an anniversary of the birth of um, the, uh, the uh, composer uh, Jester Hairston when we did a, uh, an entire program of his choral works, which the director decided he didn't want people looking down at their music. And so the entire program had to be done completely from memory. So that one was a lot of preparation, but, uh, but those were both pretty amazing experiences. Amazing. I just have like fireworks going off in my head as you're sharing my stories. That's amazing. I was not the soloist. <laughs> <laughs> I was I, I was part of a, a, a small but mighty tenor section in each case. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, there's quite a few questions. Um, if we have a moment, I'll ask one more. Uh, it got 11 upvotes. Uh, and in growing future scenarios, what are yeah. the kinds of sources you might recommend those of us in higher ed should be scanning for most divergent ideas about future changes that aren't given? The same advice that I would give to our own account teams, get out to the people on the cold face, go out and do a ride along, find out what the sources of pain are. Balanced people don't wake up every morning and get mad all over again at the frustrations and nuisances that they've started to regard as the friction, rust and gravity of their lives. And you've heard the phrase, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. Getting out there to the field and, and watching people say, wow, you have to put up with that or you still have to go look that up or wait a minute, you're, you're doing that with copying and pasting because no one ever taught you how to write a report. This can be at the very basic level of Salesforce skills or it can be at a much higher level of, um, I remember one time when two people were trying to figure out if you do one push up, then two push ups, then three push ups. By the time you're doing 100 push ups, how many total push ups have you done? And they were adding this up as a column of numbers. I said, um, that's, um, that's uh, 100 squared plus 100 over two. And they said, what? I said, the sum of a group of integers from one through n is n squared plus n quantity over two. Uh, and they, they, they didn't even know that uh, such a formula could exist, let alone know that formula. And this is the hard part. It's not that people don't know something, it's that they don't know it can be known. It's that they don't, they haven't learned to look for the pattern. And that's the, that's the bigger leap than learning the pattern is forming the habit of seeking a pattern. And if we can teach that at earlier ages, I have literally seen second graders discover Newton's laws of motion using rubber bands and roller skates without ever thinking that this was going to be hard because no one had ever told them it was going to need algebra. When you allow people discovery, when you make, put them in resource rich environments where they're invited and encouraged to do experiments, most of which will be quote failures unquote, but to learn to learn from those and iterate. This is one of the wonderful things about generative AI. Finally, Kids can ask a question, get an answer, think, oh, what if I ask that question a little differently? Now, adults and tutors, if you've asked 15 slightly different versions of the same question, they start to become impatient. They start to say, well, look, we've already talked about this. The idea that we can now offer students an interlocutor who does not become impatient and will keep refining the answer as long as you keep refining the question, this is a wonderful opportunity instead of being a threat, which many, many educators see generative AI as a threat, and it's not. It's a fabulous new Petri dish in, in which minds can grow. Thank you. Thank you for your insight and for answering that question. And I'm definitely going to walk away with that one and try to be a little more patient with my children at home. <laughs> it's, it's so years. important. It's so it important. Is. I realized I realized that we were going to try to give more time for Q and A here, and I don't know if we can. But um, I have zero problem with receiving a list of the questions and having some opportunity to respond um, as an after event uh, bonus because I realized that I, I did use um, at, at least thirty eight of my thirty minutes. Um, Amazing. We will take okay. you up on that offer for Please sure. Do. Please do. Please do. Well, thank, thank you, you all. So um, I love I love the event. I love its success, and I I look forward to continuing to be involved with you uh, as as we we go forward. 
Thank you so much, Peter. Um, everybody, if we could just give a round of applause in the chat, that was amazing. I also feel like, Peter, we could have given you like three hours and we would have been just as enamored. Like that was, an, that was outstanding. So thank you. There is only one public speaker in recorded history who was criticized for being too brief. You know who that was? Who was it? Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. Oh, really? People were insulted by the brevity of his address, but hardly anyone remembers the name of the guy who gave the proper oration as the other speaker that day, but they memorize and repeat Lincoln's words. So that tells you that, you know, bre brevity is a good thing. Right. And, and I should, I actually, you know, I, sh I should thank people who asked me to do 30 minutes instead of 90, because it really does force me to kind of concentrate things down and, and, and just have the good stuff. So thank you very much for the chance to be with you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, so we've got more great content coming. I mean, it's going to be kind of hard to follow that, but we do have four sessions coming up in the next few minutes. Um, so just a quick reminder, the way that you get there is through schedule, which is sort of just above us here on this window, or by clicking sessions, which will take you out of here and into the new tab. Um, I'm just going to display a really quick list of what to go do next. There's sessions. Feel free to also go visit our wonderful sponsors and the expo tab and also start thinking about what roundtable you're going to go to for our collaboration block in just a little bit. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, we'll see you on the next session.